Hello. Um, I have something that I want to confess today. Um, something that I'm not proud of, that I would prefer to keep it as a secret. However, being here today in this stage with you all, I feel that I must reveal it. In 2006, in a moment that I can only justify with lack of experience, I thought, I thought it was a good idea to learn Java. Uh, obviously, I was wrong, <laughs> uh, but it's funny that so many years after, I'm a .NET developer with other .NET developers talking about a technology built with Java. That's the world. So, but I'm doing it because I honestly believe that you are here for a reason. You have been hearing about Kafka for a long time. You know that Netflix uses it. You know that Uber is using it. You know that PayPal uses it as well. So what are you missing out? And likely you try to learn it. However, you never found that talk that you, you get the feeling that was designed for you as a developer. So, my goal is to have that talk here. My name is Guilherme Ferreira. Extremely hard to pronounce, let's, let's be honest. So, uh, feel free to call me Guy. I work at Farfetch, and when I got to Farfetch, Farfetch uses Kafka uh, to s support a huge event-driven architecture um, where all the applications are communicating through, through Kafka. So I had to learn it as well. And as always, when I'm learning a new technology, I like to go to conferences like this one, I like to watch videos on YouTube, and I had the feeling that I couldn't find the one for me, I couldn't find one that was using a real application, something behind the, the typical hello world message. I couldn't find one that didn't start with the basics and end with things like uh, Kafka Connect or Kafka Streams, that are things that even nowadays I don't need. I was looking for a talk that I had the feeling that was for a developer, that teach me oh, what challenges do we have designing applications with Kafka? What type of code do I need to write? So I started my adventure to create this talk a talk without slides. What I will show you is a real-world application that is currently in production. I will show you source code. I will show you diagrams. I will tell you the stories of the challenges that I had to face. And I hope you feel comfortable with that. So, but before we start, some housekeeping, OK? Um, if you have experience with Kafka, likely this is not the talk for you, OK? I have to confess. So you still have time to find an, another room. I will not take that personally, OK? So, but I was sharing with you that um, this is based on a real-world example. But what example is that? In August last year, I realized, being a known native speaker, uh, English native speaker, as you have already have noticed for sure, I realized that I was getting really rusty with my English. I was not practicing enough. And anyone here who speaks multiple languages know how it is when we don't train enough. So I had to find a, a way to have a commitment device to keep uh, trying to, to speak English as much as I can. So I, I looked for something with low exposure that I would not feel ashamed, so I decided to start a YouTube channel as it's the obvious decision. And my YouTube channel might be quite small, but there's one thing that I'm really proud of it and I want to share with you. So if you go to youtube.com and you search for Guy Ferreira, that it's me, you will also see that I'm sharing the stage with an amazing Brazilian singer with the same name that has beautiful songs that I want to share with you. <laughs> Do I have sound in the room? Yeah? Okay, so let's see if this works. For those who don't speak Portuguese, this is a beautiful music about the art of making love. Okay? 
this is the type of thing that you don't get when you search for Nick Chapsis, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you look here, okay, you can see, if I can zoom in, that I have about 6,000 subscribers. So, one day, being on the couch, watching Netflix with my wife, she is a wise person, so she asked me, how does that thing of YouTube will eventually pay the bills? So, obviously, I'm a developer, so I answered in the best way that I can. I grabbed my laptop, typed some numbers in the Google spreadsheet, and I told her, it depends. She didn't find that funny. She doesn't like consultants, to be honest. So I had to find another answer. And the typical answer in these cases for content creators like me is always the same. It's that name that is on that box, Patreon. What is Patreon? Patreon is a way that you can support your favorite creators by giving him some, some money. And usually, in exchange, you get some things back. So I needed to, to do that. But I wanted to, to give access in my MVP to the thing that everyone does, that is source code. But I don't want to do that in a way that I don't believe that is a good experience for a developer in 2023. I don't want to be zipping folders and attaching them to a web page so you download that zip file and then you have access to the source code. What I wanted to do is to commit, push to GitHub, and now you go there and you are in my organization. You can see every single thing that I do. You can even see how do I write my commit messages, for example. So I start digging into this thing, but I had an obvious challenge. How do I get from my email to a username that GitHub needs for giving access to a team? Okay? I need to have a way to do this. And I was learning Kafka, and you know how developers are. So they always find the most difficult solution for a problem. Um, so I, I decided to, to use Kafka for that. So I went to the Patreon documentation, and it's, it's amazing, I have to confess, if you believe in, in, um, in fairy tales, OK? Because nothing that is there is true that uh, I have to confess. But the good news is that they have webhooks. By having webhooks, that means that now I can have there something that will be invoked every single time that I have a new patron, every single time that the patron changes his state. So I went to look for Azure Functions because they are free at this scale, and I created an HTTP trigger Azure Function that will be invoked every single time that something happens with one of my patrons. And now I can react to that and do my stuff. So thinking about the example, it starts to make a lot of sense to me to use Kafka. Why? I know that I want to give access to GitHub, but I also know that in the future, I want to give access to other stuff. Besides that, I, I notice that I have events here. I have things like I have a new patron. That patron has canceled the membership. So those type of things are the types of events that we are looking for. So I, finally, I could start with, with this thing. So I create my Azure function, but now I have to take the decision of where I'm, I'm hosting Kafka. Okay? How do you install Kafka? You can do it with something as simple as a Docker container. You, you can go to your Azure account or AWS account. You can install it in your machine. What I decided to do was to use this thing that is Confluent Cloud. Let me just sign in, log in, and... And by the way, during a journey of learning Kafka, you will see every, in every place the word Confluent. Why does that happen? Historically, Kafka was first created at uh, LinkedIn. Okay? They created Kafka to solve one of their problems of user activity tracking, I think. And eventually, they open sourced the project. And some team members of that team that first created Kafka, they decided to leave the company to start a new organization that is this one, Confluent. And Confluent is kind of like the main steward of this project. They create a lot of libraries. They uh, have a lot of conference talks. I don't work for them. Um, they have a lot of books. They have a lot of things that they sponsor. But I'm using it for a simple reason. 
I want to use my free time recording videos. I don't want to spend it patching my Kafka cluster. Okay? So Confluent is giving me this really expensive, as you can see. Um, it's giving me this cluster. Okay? I have here my cluster. But when we, we write to something, we know that we don't write to a cluster. We usually write to something like, for example, a table if we are talking about SQL, to a queue if we are talking about uh, any type of message queue system. So what is that concept in Kafka? If we go here into my diagrams once again, I present you the topic. Okay? This is a topic. Looks like a queue. It's not a queue. The only thing that you can do with this thing, this topic, is one simple thing. That is, if you want to write something, you always append to the end. Okay? It's the only thing that you can do with it. Okay? Always appending to the end. Imagine that you have a problem on this message number three. How do you fix it? Append something to the end. The same way that you do in accounting. If you want to fix an account balance, you need to create a new movement to adjust the balance. Okay? Same idea. So the topic is immutable. Being the topic immutable, that also means that Kafka is extremely fast to write theta. Okay? It's the cheapest thing that you can do with a disk. It's appending things to the end. Besides that, you might notice here that you have a set of messages that are in order. And that is true. Kafka will preserve order of messages. So when you are consuming those messages, you can go from start to finish, and you know that you are processing things in correct order. And those numbers that you can see there are not there for uh, a stupid reason. It's be because it's, it's the offset. The offset is the number, the position of a message inside of the topic. OK? So that is what you should know about a topic. So it's kind of like a, a log file, if you think about it. Okay? It's a log file that you are always appending things to the end. So if we go back into our Confluent cloud, you can see here an option to create topics. And now, if I add a new topic, Confluent is asking for topic name, okay? give a domain name that makes sense for you, and also the number of partitions. What is this thing, partitions? So, basically, I, I have to confess that I lied to you. Uh, a topic is not like a, a log file. It's a distributed log file. Okay? It's a distributed commit log. It's the term that you'll see being used more often. And why do we say that? Because when you have a, a topic, the topic will be spread across multiple brokers. Brokers are nodes inside of your cluster. Okay? It's the different servers. So it's like if we picked up our log file, we split it in multiple chunks, and now we set each one of those to a different server. So when you have a message inside of a topic, that message will be somewhere, either on partition 1, partition 2, or partition 3. That can lead to a problem, okay, if you think about it. For example, what if my broker 2 dies? Do I lose the data inside of partition 2? That's why we have here multiple callers. So when you create your uh, infrastructure, you will have a concept of a replication factor. The replication factor will basically say, how many replicas of the same partition do you want? Okay? And on this case, let's say that I want three. By having three partitions, basically, Kafka will decide to spread those partitions across the multiple brokers. And those that you can see uh, in blue, like these ones here, th to them, we call them leaders. So they are the partitions that we talk with. Okay? If you want to send or to read data, is with those that you are communicating first. The other ones are followers, so they are being kind of updated with the changes. So you make sure that if something goes wrong and for some reason we don't have this one anymore, what, what happens? What can we do? That will initiate a process that we call the leader election, and we'll look into broker one and broker three to see if either this one or this one is in best position to now become the leader. Okay? So the goal is how we don't, uh, we don't lose data. 
that, that might happen, okay? But we'll talk about that later. So now you know what is a topic, you know what is a cluster, you know what is partitions, how they are living inside of a broker. So I think that now we can see some code, right? Okay, I went to, to Confluent Cloud, create that topic, okay? I'm calling it production patron events, and I want to write to there. How can I do that? If you go to Google and you search for .NET client for C Sharp, something like that, the thing that you will find is this one. Once again, Confluent. And Confluent Kafka.net, you, you have other options for things like uh, Python and Go, Java, they have a lot of them. And there's nothing wrong with this thing, okay? My problem with it is that it is too low level for my taste. When you are building applications, kind of microservices, or you have a lot of them, you have multiple teams working with it, eventually you will notice that by using this client, you are always doing the same stuff. You are always uh, applying the same type of principles, always uh, implementing the same things. So I prefer to use this one, that is Kafka Flow. And Kafka Flow is still uh, based on, on the other one. So under the hood, you keep using the Confluent client, but it's basically a framework that it's built on top of it that will abstract you from a lot of small implementation details. Simple things like a graceful shutdown, that is one, th one thing that you need to implement by yourself with the other one, this one is it's done just for you. And we'll see a lot of those small benefits during the, the process. And how do I do use this thing? So let's see some code. Okay. I, I'm using this one. I think it reads better. Uh, can someone there confirm to me? Yeah. Can read it? Perfect. So how can you configure your relationship with Kafka by using Kafka Flow? First thing, install the NuGet package. Then in your dependency injection configuration, you can do it in your program CS, startup CS, whatever. I basically extracted an, uh, an extension method. You will have your service collection. And now you go there and you say, please add Kafka. Then the other thing that you can do is setting a given log provider. And then you basically say, I want to connect to this cluster. This is kind of like the connection string to a SQL database. So I'm using the data provided by my friends of Confluent Cloud. Just that. Now we need to talk about other concepts. You know those uh, in a publish subscribe model, you, if you are sending data to somewhere, you are a publisher. If you are consuming that data, you are a subscriber. For some reason, in Kafka, we give it different names. Okay? So if you are sending data, you are a producer. If you are receiving that data, you are a consumer. Okay? So instead of a published subscriber, you have producers and consumers. Just that. So when you are creating your applications, you need to define kind of like the, the role that this code will, be, like, will have during the process. So here I'm saying, OK, let's have a, a producer. Because why? I'm getting those calls from the webhook, right? I'm picking the payload, the JSON that they are sending to me, and I want to send it right away into Kafka. So to do that, I need a producer. To that producer, I'm giving it a name. And then I can say things like, OK, by default, please write to this place, to this topic. If I want you to write to a different place, I will let you know. And since I don't want to spend a lot of money, I'm also applying compression. Okay? Uh, compression will save, your, save um, network costs, storage costs. Okay? It's a good thing to do. You have a few types of compression that you can use. You can see them right there. And usually it's a trade-off in terms of the speed and CPU time, all of those things. Okay? It's quite easy to find a table that will explain you um, if in your scenario, if you are, for example, reading or writing data, what, which one you should prefer. So this is basically the basic configuration of my producer. So now I'm getting all that data. I want to finally produce the message. So somewhere in my source code, I simply need to do one simple thing. Through 
dependency inversion, right? So now I'm getting the I producer accessor that comes through the, the dependency injection. Now I can get by the producer name, the one that I use to configure the, the system. And so now I can produce a message. Okay? It's right here. Okay? But we didn't talk yet what is a message, right? So let's see that. I will open another application just because I think it's excellent in terms of user experience. Um, I hope that you can read everything on the back be because uh, someone told me that the contrast of this screen is not that good. Yeah. Okay. So here you can see that I have a message. Okay. And the message has mainly three things. One of them is the value. The value is the payload of that message. And you can see here um, a JSON. Okay? And don't think that you need to always send JSON. In fact, Kafka doesn't care about, um, if you are, uh, about the type of and the protocol that you use. Okay? That is one of the benefits of Kafka. It doesn't impose you that type of stuff. So under the hood, it will all be a uh, binary data stream. Okay? So it doesn't care. In this case, it's a JSON because I'm capturing that from the body of the um, webhook, and I'm forwarding it directly into, the, into Kafka. Then I have here headers. Headers is something like um, in a HTTP request, you have HTTP headers, exactly the same concept. Okay? Key value pair, and you will be using it for things like message types, or for example, if you want a correlation ID, you can do all of those things with headers. And then you have metadata, as always. Metadata will let you know, for example, when the message was created or the offset that we discussed it. But then you have the message key. And the message key, is, for me, is one of the most important decisions that you will take when designing your applications. Okay? Why? The message key has, an, has a huge impact in a lot of small things. And don't think that the message key is kind of like an ID in a table. It's not a primary key inside of Kafka. It's, it's not. Why, in this case, in that source code that I was showing you, besides setting the value, the headers, I'm setting the message key as email. So I told you that messages are in order in the topic, right? However, when you are consuming the messages, you will have a consumer per each partition. So in fact, you can only guarantee order when consuming those messages per partition. Because if I'm processing a given partition and you are by my side and you are also doing it, if one of us takes more time, it will change the order, right? Because we can, we can pick those messages at the same time. So, since I want to make sure that everything is processed in the correct order, I need to be pretty sure that the messages will go into the same partition. And you do that by using the message key. And why is that so important? Imagine that I have an, a new event saying, OK, you have a new patron. Now I have another updated saying, OK, this patron has the payment status as pending. Now I have another one saying it's paid. Now I have another one saying he canceled the subscription. Now imagine that I get these things in the reverse order. What's the final state of this patron, right? So order is important to me. So I'm setting the email here. And why set, by setting the email we guarantee that? In our diagram that we have here, it's easy to see that. Imagine that I'm sending that message. I set the message key. It will, Kafka will look into the message key, will apply a hash, and based on the hash, it will find that that message should be on partition one. So every single message for the same patron, so with the same message key, will be sent exactly to the same place. Okay? This way I know that the consumer that is working on that partition will process things in order. What if I don't care about order? What if the only thing that I care is about velocity. It's about throughput of the system. You simply go there and you set message key to null, and by doing that, Kafka will do a run-robin strategy that first let's go to partition 1, then partition 2, then partition 3. It will spread the load across the different partitions. Why? 
Imagine that you have a partition that is getting all the load because the calculation, the hash, is redirecting every single thing into there. Or, for example, I have a patron with more events than the other ones. So I have a consumer that has more work to do than the other ones. So this is one of the key decisions that you will have during the process of designing your solutions with, with Kafka. Okay, so getting back. Now I'm getting those events from Kafka, from a patron. I don't trust their API because the documentation part. Uh, I can tell you that I implemented everything according to the documentation, and it's hard to, to test, ru test run this, this thing because it, you can only test it in production. So in the first time that I had a patron, I noticed that the payload didn't match what they were saying. So I, on that moment, I decided that I always absorb every single thing into here, and then I can handle it later. Because if they change the contract, or if it comes something that I'm not expecting, I can handle it later. Okay? So it's a good principle when you don't trust third parties. So on this case, what I'm doing now is that since I'm getting every single thing from them and the things that they are sending to me, you can see here, it's a huge JSON that doesn't say a lot. And in terms of message type, it's basically saying it was created or it was updated. I can't understand if this was a problem with payment, if the person decided to cancel this thing. So I have to dig into multiple things inside of that payload to find that out. So I decided to implement this patron manager. That is, he has a, a kind of a internal storage, and it will start calculating um, what changed during the process. So I can find out events that have meaning to me. Things like, is this an activated patron? If so, likely I can send him an email, and when I send him an email, I will send a link. He can go to a given form, fill out the GitHub username, and now I can give him access. Okay? Or was this person canceling the subscription? Okay? So I will deny it. Or uh, I can always go to the team and remove the person to keep things in shape, to remove the benefit. So that is what this patron manager is doing. So he's sending to this thing on the left, those events that have meaning to me. And on the right, I'm sending something that I call a snapshot. And I will talk about that later. But, it, but it's important to say that now you can see that this application has basically three roles. is consuming data, but also is producing data. Not only that, but it's producing data to two different topics. If we go to the code of this application, not this one, uh, patron manager. And we see, once again, configuration of dependency injection. This time we have here a small change that is one of those small benefits of Kafka flow. Typically, when you have, for example, a, a web application and you want to have consumers running inside of that web, web application, you need to implement a hosted service or a background job. By having this line, Kafka flow will host, uh, will have a hosted service for you. Okay? You don't care about that. Otherwise, you will need to implement all of that thing. So I have that. I'm connecting to the cluster. We already know how to do that. And I'm adding here the consumer. I will get back to it in a moment. But then you can see that I have here add producer once again. And I told you that this thing is producing to two different topics, right? But I only have one producer. Why? Kafka has the concept of batch producing, okay, to optimize the writes. So you can even say, please produce this thing in batch to two different places, what is amazing. So th that's the thing that you can do with the producer. And here in the producer, you can see also that I'm setting the compression, as I have done in the past, but also I have this weed hacks or with acknowledgments. And with acknowledgments has three possible values. All, leader, and none. What are those things? So the way that I see Kafka is a kind of a um, hybrid between a database and a messaging system. Okay? Why? Because you have a lot of small configurations that you can do 
to adjust the needle either to one side or to the other one. Okay? You will see that. And this one is one of those things. If you send a message saying, I want the acknowledgments to none, what will happen is that, for example, the message will get into the leader, and then you'll get the response, and you, and you are not sure if the message was committed okay? when you are looking to the feedback. Okay? And now you might ask, but that way I might lose data. Yeah. Sometimes you don't care, right? You want throughput of the system. You have things like telemetry. Why not losing some events? Okay? You can afford to that. Other times, you, you can't do it. So you can use, for example, the acknowledgments to leader. And when you have to leader, what will happen is that you will get the response saying that, OK, it was on the leader. It's now, uh, sorry. It, the response will say, okay, it's on the leader and it's committed on the leader, so now you can move forward. Okay? If you want to be really, really, really sure that you don't lose that thing, you set it to all and then first goes to the leader, then replicas are updated, only then you get the response and you can check that now you will not lose that data. Okay? But also, it's a trade off. Okay? You are losing speed in favor of and not losing data. So that's why it's important those small decisions in, in Kafka. But we were talking about the, that patron manager that has here a consumer. We have seen what is a producer. We didn't see what is a consumer. So when you define a consumer, it's kind of like the same thing. Add consumer, now you say, which topic I, am I consuming? Now you can give it a name that will be useful in operations if you go to a dashboard to see which consumers do you have. We have this group ID that I would prefer to talk about it later. I'm setting here the workers count that is one of those, I think it's my favorite feature of Kafka Flow. And why? While in Kafka you have those partitions on the topic, and you can bring more of those partitions to scale your system horizontally, so you don't need to bring another topic to, to scale. You just scale the number of partitions. And now, by having more partitions, you can have more consumers. Okay? But sometimes you will realize that, for example, one of those consumers is handling those messages, but it's not fast enough. Okay? It's not handling it on the speed that you need. But also, you will look into the, the details of that machine, and you can see the resources are not being utilized. So what can you do? With this small configuration, I'm basically saying, please use three threads okay, and process them in parallel. And, and you might think, OK, what does that has so special? And the special thing about this is that even defining that, you are preserving the order of the messages. And that is a, a challenge really hard to solve. So you can use this feature to scale inside of your machine, okay? to use the resources efficiently. The other thing that I'm defining here is this auto, reset, auto offset reset earliest. What does that mean? It means that on the first time that I'm consuming that topic, I can point the needle to the beginning of the topic. And why that, does that, that is important? When you produce a message, to, when you read a message from Kafka, you consume a message. It's not like a message queue. In a message queue, you read it, the message disappears from the queue, right? With Kafka, it stays there. Because the process of reading and the deleting data is decoupled. Okay? They will not happen at the same time. That's why a topic is a kind of lock, uh, like a log file. It has everything there, and eventually you might delete those entries. Okay? But it's eventually. We'll talk about that later. So this is one of those features that when you present this to an organization, everyone loves it. Why? Because that means that now, in one year, someone can come, create a new application to build a given database regarding clients, and they can point to the client's topic and reveal with the entire state of the system. You can also point to the beginning, for example, to replay all the events, and to trying to di diagnose a given problem. You can do all of those things because those, that data is, is not deleted. The other thing that we have here with Kafka Flow is that we define middlewares. Anyone here has used Mediator? This is the type of question that I'm surprised. 
Anyone has problems with the arm to raise the arm? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so with Mediator, you have a, a chain of responsibility where each handler can handle a message and send it to the next one or transform the message. In Kafka Flow, you have the same, but with middlewares. It's the same idea. So what I'm doing in this case is that I'm saying, OK, first thing that you need to do when you get a new message from the topic is let's deserialize that thing. Let, let's convert the binary thing into a type object. Okay? Once I have the type object, please forward it to the next middleware. And the next middleware is this one that has the responsibility that, based on that object, to find an handler to execute that code. So, for example, if the message is in a patron updated event, I will deliver to that handler, and that handler has the, all the source code that I need to, to handle that message. The cool thing about this is that in a single file, I describe the complete relationship with Kafka. Okay? In the handlers, I will implement the logic. So I'm not mix and matching things. Okay? I don't have those infrastructure details inside of my handlers. Okay? And that is really valuable. Besides the fact that, as you can see, is, is quite descriptive, is a fluent definition, it's quite easy to do it. That's why I, I like it. So now you know how do we consume messages. Now you know how we produce messages. Okay? We are moving forward. So now I'm processing that thing. I have a patron updated, for example. I trigger a new event. I create a new event on that side here saying, yeah, th this person now should have access to, to, the G to GitHub. So now I bring a new application, that is this one, that if the message says that the patron is activated, I will send him an email. The email will have a link to go to a given web page to leave the GitHub username. The good thing about this type of architecture, it's a kind of evolutionary architecture. Why? What if? In one day, I want to bring, for example, a mailing list, and I want to build a mailing list when I have a new patron. I can always have here my mailing list, and then I can bring another box like this one here, and I can process exactly the same things, okay? without touching the existing uh, code. This also is a benefit, because in many organizations, you don't want different teams impacting the work of each other. Okay? So this way, you can scale your system, because they, they can keep consuming those messages. What, what have I learned when I implemented this thing? So first, thing that I, first time that I deployed it, I had a friend that was a patron. I think he still is. I hope so. And he, he told me that he got the email twice. And I found that strange, and I went to to the logs, and I realized that I handled the, the same message twice. So I went to look into why that happened. And Kafka has the process of at least once delivery. So Kafka wants to be really sure that you will get the message. It doesn't, it doesn't promise that you will only deliver it once. So you might need to, to have things like idempotency in place. Okay? You need to think about those, those cases or message the duplication. In my case, it was quite simple. I just created a table with tracking the emails that I already sent, and I avoid sending a duplicated email. But this is the type of concern that you need to have when designing an application on top of Kafka. So I'm sending my emails. They are getting it. And now they have a link. The link will redirect to another application that is a web app. The web app has a, a form. The form has a simple field saying, please leave here your GitHub username. My first idea, once you click it, I add you to the, to the team. Work done. I was wrong. Why? I forgot to update the access token. And um, I'm not sure if you know, but by default, GitHub invites you to have a lifetime of the access token of 30 days or 60 days, quite, quite short. And I missed the notification, and I didn't update it. So what happens? Now you are a new patron. You want to have access to the source code. You go there, you fill the form, you click the button, you get an error. You try again. You get an error. You don't try again. You cancel the membership. Okay? That's what happened. And besides the fact of being dumb and forgetting to 
to update the access token, what might happen is that GitHub has throttling in the API. So they can refuse on that moment to process that message. Or they might be down. All of that can happen. So how do I protect myself? I'm using Kafka, so why not? Having a new topic here, and I will send an event to there saying, OK, I have data now that says the, the GitHub username of my patron. So I'm producing a new event to there. Now I can react to it and have a new application that has a single responsibility that is calling the GitHub API. Okay? And I don't need to scale this application because otherwise throttling and all of that. But there's one thing that you might notice here is that uh, the topic is being consumed by this, but also by this. How is that possible? Right? Here comes the, that concept that I skipped of the group ID. Okay? The group ID is uh, a concept of consumer groups. So in Kafka, consumers work, can work as a team. They have an intent, something that, I need to, that they need to do. And I like to explain that with uh, a book. Let's pretend that this book, let me just go to this side. I've never been in this side of the stage. It's quite beautiful from there. Uh, let's imagine that this book is, is a topic, OK? Each page of the book is a new message. Pages have numbers, offsets, OK? Kind of the same idea. Now let's say that this bookmark from the dark side of the force is mine. So I'm reading the book. When I finish to read the book today, I can put the bookmark. To this we call committing the offset, okay? The last message that I have read. So the last page. And now I can close the book and I will get back to it later, okay? Now let's say that at my home, I can have different people also reading the same book, okay? This one can be the bedtime story for my daughter. She falls asleep with test-driven development as many developers. <laughs> um, and one cool thing about this is that this bookmark might be used by multiple consumers. For example, I can read two pages today, and I will bookmark this thing. I will put the, the book aside. Tomorrow, my wife can pick the book. She will just look for the bookmark, read two more pages without knowing the context of previous pages. We are working in a consumer group. That's the same idea. But that didn't impact the other consumer group. So reading for my intent or for the intent of she falling asleep, it's two different intents of the applications. Okay? The same way that marketing might be consuming your client events for building a mailing list, and logistics can be processing exactly the same data for another purpose, okay? to collect shipping addresses or things like that. So that's the idea. Other curious thing is that you, when you bookmark uh, a book, you keep it inside of the book. You don't write the page on a post-it note and carry it with you. Okay? That is exactly the same thing that happens with Kafka. You commit the offset to the Kafka topic, okay? or it might be in something that we call Zookeeper, but that is going away, I think so. And that means that if something goes wrong, we, that uh, consumer disappears, you can always get back to it, and, and you know where you left. Okay? You don't need to carry that offset with you. It's exactly the same idea. So, and you can see that on my applications. Because if you go into, for example, the patron manager, you see that it has a group ID here, okay? and you will see that it's different from the GitHub patron manager that has another group ID. Okay? So they are working with two different intents. They are consuming exactly the same messages. That's the idea. Okay? And it's a huge benefit of Kafka. So what is missing in all this diagram, that famous topic here? That topic has a kind of a picture of my patron. So one thing is the events. So things like it's activated, it canceled the membership. Other thing is the picture of kind of like the, a database record, a document, let's say. So if I want to look into a table with my patrons because I want to, for example, 
send them an email or do something with them, I can look into this topic. This topic has something special that I will share with you. And this is one of the types of uh, use cases that you can have with Kafka. Besides events, you can have pictures being stored somewhere. So if we go back into Confluent Cloud, and let me log in. They are really strict with authentication. Um, so if we go there and we go to create a topic once again, loading, loading, water. OK, besides the topic name and the partitions, you can also define a cleanup policy. And what does this cleanup policy say? It says that it will delete data after one week. Okay? And you can have, for example, let's delete data after one day. Imagine that it is telemetry data and you don't want to store it for a long time. But also, you can say something like this. Let's never delete it. Now it's working kind of like a database, right? You have this option. And, but this compact, this cleanup thing um, has some benefits, obviously. And there's one mode here that is the compact. That to me, it's quite the first time that I've seen this. It's quite strange thinking about it, because while the other one says that after a given period of time, I will delete everything older than that, or for example, when I reach a given size limit, I'm deleting the oldest things, with this one, we'll use once again the message key. I told you, the message key is really important. And instead of deleting the oldest things, we'll delete the oldest versions per message key. Make sense? So like, imagine that you have um, a topic with addresses from your clients, okay? shipping addresses. You don't need the oldest versions of them. Okay? If you can throw them away, why not? Okay? It's kind of like a distinct, let's say, where you keep the latest version of that. And in my case, this is a, a picture of that, that um, patron. I think it's a good idea. So that's why you use, you use the, the, the compact. As always, even in the compact, you can define things like different retention time um, and so on. One important part about compact is, is that it doesn't mean that you never have duplicated by message key, because between the time of running the, the cleanup until the moment that you are reading that data, it, something new might be there. Okay? It's just a way of Kafka keep things in shape. Okay? So during this time, we have learned what is a, a topic, what is a partition, how that relates to the cluster itself, what type of, of decisions do you, have to, do you need to have, the important things like the message key, the acknowledgments. Um, we also have seen how to build an evolutionary architecture that we can keep adding things to it without impacting too much each other. We have seen how to do that with C Sharp and Kafka Flow. And what I can tell you is that now you can leave this room knowing that you know the basics of Kafka. Okay? There's many things more that you can learn. Things like uh, schema registries, or Kafka streams, or Kafka Connect. But all of that is built on top of these concepts. Okay? This is all that you need to, to know to be able to understand if Kafka is even useful for a given scenario that you have. It's enough for you to go to a job interview at Netflix and at least say that you know what is Kafka, okay? besides the, the writer. Um, I hope that you have learned something here today. I would love to show my last slide. So thank you, y obrigado. Okay.